I'm Congresswoman Barbara Lee, and I proudly represent California's beautiful 13th Congressional District. Thank you to AIDS United and the Treatment Access Expansion Project, as well as the U.S. People Living with HIV Caucus. Thank you for your advocacy and providing, inviting me to join you today for the 28th Annual AIDS Watch. I'm so happy to be sharing the program with my Congressional HIV AIDS Caucus co-chair, Representative Jennifer Gonzalez Colon, our heroic CDC staff and other HIV advocates for doing such important work in our communities. As we fight a global pandemic, the need for strong HIV advocacy has never been greater. Communities impacted by HIV are struggling under the burden of a public health crisis compounded by systemic inequality and racism. We have a lot of work ahead of us to build trust in our public health system, especially for communities of color, not to mention the previous administration waged an unprecedented assault on the rights of historically marginalized HIV vulnerable communities in the United States. That must be reversed. Trust is critical to actualizing biomedical prevention and treatment options for HIV, including HIV testing, PrEP and PEP, and treatment as prevention. These critical service delivery options have experienced significant interruptions due to the coronavirus. As our nation grapples with this devastating public health crisis, the infectious disease workforce has had to shift their attention entirely to caring for COVID-19 patients, leaving people with HIV with fewer options for care. Hospital and clinic closures have made HIV testing, labs, and screening for PrEP increasingly difficult across the country. As these service disruptions and closures continue, and social distancing regulations ease, an increase in HIV transmission and sexually transmitted infection incidence is estimated across the nation. So now, after a disheartening four years, our job is more important than ever. We must work to restore the trust and faith that vulnerable communities and people living with HIV must have in our public health system if we ever want to make this an AIDS-free generation, which I'm hopeful and have a lot of inspiration and excitement that we will get there. We need to repeal policies that permit stigmatization and address the widespread discrimination within our healthcare system. We need to implement policies that increase funding and resources for vulnerable communities. And we need to eliminate unjust and punitive practices that target certain groups, including decriminalizing sex workers and improving HIV prevention for sex workers. I am confident that with the Biden-Harris administration and with strong leadership in Congress, we can take the necessary steps to restore and uphold the rights of those impacted by HIV. As co-chair of the Congressional HIV Caucus and chair of the House Appropriations Subcommittee on State and Foreign Operations, I am committed to fighting for more investment in fighting HIV and AIDS, both here at home and around the world. Despite the regression of the last four years, I am confident that these next four years and the years to follow will be marked by unceasing commitment to being an AIDS-free generation. Thank you all so very much for your hard work. Thank you for your, what you do each and every day. And um, I will see you on the other side of this pandemic. Hello. It is a privilege and an honor as a partner of AIDS Watch and a representative of the United States Persons Living with HIV Caucus Steering Committee to welcome you to our second virtual and 28th annual AIDS Watch. For all of you living with HIV, we commend you for the work you do to ensure policies are put in place to enhance our lives. For all first timers, we welcome you for embarking upon a new journey of leadership and allowing your voice and voices and stories to be heard. As a black woman living with HIV and working in the rural South, it is important that we step up and demand a place at the table and let our voices be heard or we will be forgotten. Together, 
with our allies, we must forge forward, especially in the South, to change the scenario of stigma and discrimination. Our lives have meaning and worth. We will not be silenced. Wake up, everybody. It's a new day dawning. Let's do our part to end the epidemic, to end ignorance, and uplift policies that enhance the lives of people living with HIV. My voice is important. Our voice, your voice is important. Our voices together magnify. We are mighty in numbers. Let our voices speak truth to power. Happy AIDS Watch, everyone. Good morning and good afternoon. My name is Mary Ann. I am from the Treatment Access Expansion Project, an initiative of the Center for Health Law and Policy Innovation. What a year it has been. This time last year, we had our first virtual AIDS Watch conference. Parts of the country were beginning to close down and many of us were entering a world of Zoom and virtual work led by the years of advocacy from the disability community who have long used technology in education, workplace, and other spheres of everyday life. Many of us were also navigating what it means to connect with loved ones with intentional distance. A year later, an election later, a riot later, we return to gather together. I don't know about you, but I am a big bag of emotions. I am excited for 2021, don't get me wrong, but I'm also tired and hurt. Black people, brown people, trans people continue to be treated as if they deserve less and mean less, yet expected all the same to sit, listen, and play nice. I'm tired of the growing body count at the hands of police, at families torn at the hands of ICE, and the normalization of violence by white supremacists. Indigenous women continue to go missing and found murdered, and people that look like my mother, my aunties, my wai po, wai gong, getting spat at, beaten, cut across the face, shot, and killed by people who are just having a bad day. And while I'm tired and hurt and definitely cynical because these are not new issues or issues that can be solved with a Band-Aid, I am pragmatic. And I know that we are sitting at the cusp of a promised new era of change. We not only have a president who lends more support for progressive policy than our more recent one, we also have a Congress, shout out to Georgia, with a Democratic majority. We know what we need and we know what we need to do. We have a short window to make to work and make sure that we pass legislation with a simple majority. But in order to do that, we need to remain a priority in Congress and a priority in the White House. 2021 has already seen movement in DC. We have seen the American Rescue Plan, which has brought more financial support to individuals and families. We have seen movement to undo Trump policies, like the recent letters to Arkansas and New Hampshire rescinding approval of Medicaid work requirements. We have seen significant bills like the Equality Act move through Congress, and we have started to see in proposed policies like the proposed pathway for citizenship for people who do not have documentation. Things are getting done and we need to make sure that our issues and our requests get done too. We aren't in DC physically, and we won't have the effect of blanketing, bl blanketing the Capitol with shirts that proudly proclaim, this is what an advocate looks, HIV advocate looks like. But we will be present, and we will make sure that our presence is known. I'm so excited for the next three days to hear and learn from you and others, and to connect with people who have the same goal as I do come Wednesday make our voices heard and get the protections, the funding, the opportunities we need to support people living with HIV and end the epidemic. Thank you for joining us and welcome to AIDS Watch 2021. Thank you. And thank you, Marianne, and thank you, Pat, for those great words. 
and thank you to all of you who are joining our third virtual AIDS Watch. I'm Jesse Milan, the President and CEO at AIDS United, and it is my great joy to welcome you once again to this important event. This year, we're joining together in the first 100 days of the Biden-Harris administration and the first 100 days of the new Congress. It really does feel like a new day. It certainly feels different from March a year ago, as Mary Ann just described at the start of this pandemic, and different from March of four years ago after the 2016 election. And I think that's because there is hope, hope from executive orders being rescinded and new ones for equity being created, hope from a presidential commitment to end the HIV epidemic even sooner, and hope from women and people of color and people of trans and gay experience taking historic leadership roles in our federal government like never before. And of course, there's hope from legislation to stimulate our economy and to get shots into our arms. There's a lot of hope. But my sense of hope is very much tempered by shock and fear and anger. Fear and anger that white supremacy is trying to limit our rights to vote, that murders of Black people and Asian people and trans people continue, that too many people don't want brown people crossing our border to find a better life. And I still have fear and shock and anger that an insurrection was attempted right in front of our very eyes. And like all of you, I'm still processing how the COVID pandemic has changed our work and our lives and perhaps for good. But whether this year or last year or four years ago or 28 years ago at the first AIDS Watch, our reason for gathering at AIDS Watch is the same. That 40 years ago, a virus called HIV came into our world and is still impacting us today. I've been thinking quite a bit about that. What was I feeling in March a year ago or March four years ago, but also what was I feeling March 40 years ago? Today is the 81st day of this year, but in March of 81, we were just three months away from the CDC releasing in June the MMWR reporting the first official cases of what we now know as AIDS. For those of us like me who are longtime survivors, we remember March of 81, but we probably don't remember it for anything very significant. I think if I think back, I was preparing for midterms in law school. I had no idea at that time that 18 months later, in the summer of 82, I would suddenly have these horrible flu-like symptoms that signaled that HIV had entered my body and my life. And I certainly had no idea that the virus would still be with me today. What we long-term HIV survivors have experienced over the years is what millions have experienced compressed into one year of the COVID-19 pandemic a virus that seemed at the beginning to only touch people in one community, but that quickly became a global threat. A virus with no cure causing widespread fear and isolation, a virus leaving people dying alone in ICUs and people who are positive feeling stigmatized. A virus that is characterized by racial inequities, discrimination, and by a lack of access to care. Believe it or not, today I'm still waiting for my vaccine. That's both my COVID vaccine and an HIV vaccine. So if our nation can rally in warp speed to confront the COVID virus, the nation should surely rally around us to stop a virus that's been with us for four decades. And that's why we're here at AIDS Watch again, because the lessons and the successes 
as well as the failures and the needs in our response to COVID are ones that we've known in the HIV community for years. That access to healthcare, access to insurance, and health inequities must be addressed. And for us, the wonders of ARVs, of U equals U and PrEP, and the important roles of SSPs should be known by everyone and accessed everywhere. And that our rights to equality must be recognized and protected for every one of us in every state we live. And so we still have so much advocacy left to do. This year, we have over 200 meetings with Congress and the administration's plan for you. So let's listen today and learn and share, and then let's use our voices to tell the Congress and the administration what we need, what we want, and why. That's what AIDS Watch is for. And so as we get started today, let's recognize who's in this virtual house. So if you're joining AIDS Watch for the first time, type in the chat first timer. All right. Let's see those first timers. If you're a long term survivor of HIV, type in the chat survivor. Let's see those survivors. And if you're here to advocate for what we need and for what we want, type in the chat, I'm an advocate. Advocates, type it in there. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you so much for supporting and being part of AIDS Watch. And now, as we get started, I'm very pleased to bring to you a very special welcome from a famous ally who is bringing his voice for the first time to AIDS Watch. He's become a huge supporter of AIDS United on his television, television show that is seen by millions every week. He announced on his show without being asked by us or prompted by us to donate to our work the proceeds from his book about a gay character, a bunny rabbit who wanted to be loved for just being who he is. The book is called A Day in the Life of Marlon Bundo, and it became a bestseller. And it's teaching tolerance and acceptance, and it's, it's inspiring, inspiring LBGTQ parents and youth of all ages. Since 2018, he has donated all of the proceeds from A Day in the Life of Mar Marlon Bundo to Age United and to the Trevor Project, and the Trevor Project is one of our newest sponsors for AIDS Watch this year. And over the years, that book has brought us together over a million dollars. We could not be more pleased or proud to have his support, and we could not be more excited to have his virtual welcome for all of you today. So please join me in viewing this special message from the host of Last Week Tonight with John Oliver, an advocate and a first timer to AIDS Watch, Mr. John Oliver. Good afternoon. I'm John Oliver, host of HBO's Last Week Tonight, uh, and I'm absolutely thrilled to support AIDS United, its partners, and the attendees of AIDS Watch. In its 28th year, AIDS Watch has grown to be the largest and most impactful grassroots gathering of people living with HIV to impact policy change to end the epidemic. So thank you so, so much for your work towards ending this epidemic. Every single voice matters. Have a spectacular afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Carl Baloney, in the flesh as opposed to that cartoon from earlier. I serve as Vice President and Chief Advocacy Officer at AIDS United, and I'm so pleased to be with all of you for what's shaping up to be another amazing AIDS Watch. First, thanks to all of you for lending your voices, and second, thanks to our wonderful supporters from Congress and the media, including HBO's who's been a great friend to AG9 and the movement for the past few years. And we are so appreciative of him for using his platform to amplify the call to end the epidemic. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome one of our own, a star in the community, 
Dr. Dimitri Daskalaskis, the new CDC Director of the Division of HIV AIDS Prevention in the National Center for HIV Viral Hepatitis, STD, and TB Prevention. A self-described queer health warrior, Dr. Daskalaskis is committed to ending the HIV epidemic and ending HIV stigma through, status, through a status neutral approach, which I'm sure we'll all learn more about. Welcome Dr. Dimitri to the 20th, 28th annual AIDS Watch. Oh, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, Jesse and all the other speakers, thank you so much. I, before I even put my slides up, it's such a great honor to be here at AIDS Watch, um, even though it is virtual. Um, and as I uh, take a pause from HIV uh, to be called into the COVID space, um, I think that um, the, the, the words that Jesse said really echo with me so strongly that really the lessons of our pandemic, our HIV pandemic, and our lessons of the, uh, of the COVID pandemic are so similar. And so uh, sort of coming as a, a, a human uh, who grew up uh, in, in the world of HIV first, uh, medical care advocacy, and now uh, governmental public health. Uh, I'm really excited to be able to join you and uh, to take a, a, a few minutes uh, away from my, my role in COVID and equity to, uh, to address you all. I, I also want to say that, um, that one of the important lessons uh, for those of you who are new uh, to this meeting is that uh, the line between advocate um, and government in HIV has always been fuzzy and that's so important. So the work that you do is work that we do and it really allows us to achieve uh, uh, the combined vision of, of really controlling the HIV epidemic uh, in a way that is both lo loving and respectful to all the populations uh, who, are, uh, who are affected by this virus and others. So with that, I will share my screen uh, and will demonstrate my technological abilities in about one second if I do this right. I believe that other than seeing my email up, which is fine, you should now be able to see my screen. So thank you again. Uh, and I will uh, really focus my, my comments on uh, the CDC's efforts to end the HIV epidemic and reduce disparities. And I, I feel like this group, especially this will resonate that really there, there's nothing that really ends. And I wanna start with that, that really this is about what I like to think of as really tight or elite control of the HIV epidemic and the work that we can get to to prove that even in the absence of the vaccine that Jesse uh, appropriately is called for or cure, um, what we do have at hand is able to really push us in the direction where we're able to achieve pandemic control and end the epidemic by achieving this higher level of, uh, like, as I like to call it, elite control of HIV in the US. And so in case you don't know me, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Dimitri and uh, I am uh, an HIV doctor. That's how I came up, but I really started um, from the early days uh, in sort of advocacy and, uh, and, and working in the community before I was a physician. Um, and you know, I worked in clinical care, in research, and then when I moved uh, to New York, uh, I actually started doing what I didn't even know was called public health, but uh, launching uh, HIV testing and prevention programs in commercial sex venues uh, and, and, and also doing some important vaccine work in meningitis during a big outbreak in, uh, in New York City. Uh, that led me to public health, where I uh, ran the, uh, the, the um, HIV Bureau at the New York City Department of Health, eventually becoming uh, the division director um, for disease control and then ultimately being the uh, incident commander um, for both a large measles outbreak and then for nine months of a COVID vaccine, which meant that I was uh, the prime contact point for the Department of Health uh, for so many people who were doing work to, uh, to really control the COVID uh, pandemic as well. So that's where I come from. And now I'm at CDC um, and it's a really exciting time. And again, um, a lot of energy, but also a lot of challenge. So I'm really happy to be here to talk about the amazing chance that we have. And so I think um, it's clear um, that the main word on this slide that's the most important is mobilization. And so uh, as I speak to you who are such strong and powerful advocates, um, this is about mobilizing us the community, all of us, to end HIV. And so again, um, we have the tools at our hand. We have the ability to achieve this end. It is about both resources and the political will to be able to achieve it. And I think we're all very enthusiastic uh, that, a new, that a, 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 the next chapter of this work has begun and um, we will uh, launch into it with, with great gusto and passion as we always do. Now, it's important to remember um, that we are seeing 
um, you know, some important disparities in HIV, though we are, do see trends of decreasing uh, new uh, infections in the United States. Um, we are seeing a, a bit of a plateauing, although again, the trend continues to be down. But when you unpack that and really look uh, from the perspective, not only of aggregate or overall data, but also uh, by race and transmission group, what you see is that the decreases that we're seeing in new HIV infections um, are actually overrepresented among white, gay, and bisexual men. Um, when you look at other populations, whether by race or transmission group, um, they appear to be stable or in some cases slightly increasing. So this really, I think, highlights uh, a very important point made by all of the folks who opened the session here, which is that HIV is uh, a disease that is driven by, uh, by racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, and all of the isms and phobias that come together. So I think from the perspective of the work, it's not possible to just say that we have a biomedical or some biomedical interventions to change what's happening, but really it's critical to say we need to address stigma and the isms that get in the way of us being able to implement the amazing work and the amazing technology that we have. Because remember, I think that those of you who are uh, living with HIV who are taking medicines or those of you who are potentially on pre-exposure prophylaxis, I don't think it is an overstatement to say that those are miraculous interventions. It's just that they need to go in the community in a way that is appropriate and responsive to their need. Um, it's not just about uh, race or ethnicity or identity from the perspective of who you have sex with or whether or not you use drugs, but it's also about geography. So when you look at the rates of diagnoses of HIV among adults and adolescents in, in uh, the United States, um, what you'll see is that the, the there, that we are overrepresented in the South and a couple of other parts of the country. So it's not just about the who, it's about the where. And as you are embarking on a world focusing on policy and advocacy, it's really about both uh, advocating in uh, a, on the federal and national level, but also advocating locally, as I think we've seen time and time again, since so much of disparity is driven by geography and, uh, and by local issues that often hamper uh, bigger goals and aspirations. Now, it's really important um, that there are many strategies that we know uh, can actually lead to better pandemic or epidemic control. And so um, this is a quick view of what we call the HIV care continuum. So you can see that the first step is knowledge of status. That means people need to know that they have HIV or not. Now, I argue that both a positive result or a negative result are equally important because if you know your status either way, there are interventions that you can do to keep yourself healthy, whether that's treatment, uh, harnessing the power of treatment for both uh, personal health and prevention, that's U equals U, or also harnessing uh, prevention in the form of pre-exposure prophylaxis to prevent HIV. So we have work to do. 86% of those with HIV uh, know their status. But when you look at younger individuals, only 55% know. So that's one clear disparity that relates to age and not just to race or ethnicity. Um, when you look at linkage to medical care, and we define that as uh, connecting to someone for care within one month after your HIV diagnosis, you'll see that there's a pretty stark racial disparity with 83% of whites connecting within a month with, uh, and 77% of black Americans connecting. Um, so you'll see that work continues to be done. And again, Hispanic and Latinos uh, uh, approximate whites. When you look at receipt of medical care, and that means um, having a CD4 test or a viral load test during a year, a very similar trend can be seen with uh, whites having a higher percentage uh, and Hispanic and Latino individuals and Black Americans being about the same. And then viral suppression, which is not the end all and be all, but a really important marker of good care, shows again a similar disparity with whites demonstrating 71% uh, who are, who are uh, with HIV who are uh, viral suppression compared to a, a little bit over 60% or 60 for Black African Americans and 64% for Hispanic Latinos. So th though again, viral suppression is not the end all and be all. There are important other qualities of care that are critical. It is definitely a good gauge of, of where we see disparity in the system and where more work needs to be done. This is another way of looking at this from the perspective of, of new uh, 
uh, of prevalence of HIV infection uh, compared to population in the United States. So if you look on the left side, that left donut, that represents uh, what percentage of, of uh, people living with HIV identify as African American, Latino, white, et cetera. When you look at the, at the donut on the right, that actually shows you the breakdown of the, uh, the US population. So it does not take a high, level math, a high level mathematician to see that 13 does not equal 41%. So 13% of the population is African American when 41% of people living with HIV are African American and 18 does not equal to 23 nor does 60 equal 29. So this really, I think, in a very clear way demonstrates the challenges and also the opportunities to improve health equity uh, and use HIV as the guiding force to be able to do this, given the fact that this has been so much the core of the work for so many decades. Um, it's also important to note um, that despite reductions that are seen overall in women, for instance, um, there continues to be disparities depending on gender status, whether you're cis or trans, and also race. So transgender women, for instance, have an HIV prevalence of 14%. Now, it's important to remember you got to take that in context. So that's a smaller population, but a lot of people are living with HIV, and that compares to 0.5% of the overall U.S. population. And also, um, the uh, disparity is pretty uh, uh, extreme in, among Black women, with the rate of new HIV infections among Black women being 13% that of white women. So I'll tell you, um, having come from a jurisdiction uh, before I came to CDC that worked so hard to ending the HIV epidemic, it is... It is terrifying the notion that at some point there may be a moment where we're going to say we've ended HIV in white women or white people, but we haven't ended it in black women or black people. So this is what we're up against and this is what the charge is to not only focus on the biomedical, but also on the equity issues um, and the uh, strategies that we have to create equity rather than just equality among populations. Speaking of equity and equality, the, the gaps in PrEP are also important to discuss. So when you look at uh, this slide, it represents PrEP coverage among people over 16 years by race or ethnicity in the United States. And what you'll see is that about 18% of the just over 1 million people who could benefit from PrEP are actually on it. Um, and this again is 2018 data. But when you disaggregate that data and take a look by race and ethnicity, you see that, um, that white individuals um, have a much higher rate of coverage than Hispanic, Latino, or Black African Americans um, who would benefit from PrEP. So again, not only are there, uh, are there inequities in treatment, there are also clear inequities in prevention. And again, lots of, lots of room for ongoing work to improve that, uh, again, uh, which is often driven by racism, sexism, and homophobia. So really focusing uh, on the core driver as opposed to some of the symptoms of the disease instead. Um, when you look again at viral suppression, this is another uh, way of sort of looking at this uh, from the perspective of the 2018 data. You can see again that when you compare Black people um, with uh, with folks overall living with HIV, that there are gaps in care, there's gaps in retention, and also in viral suppression, which again highlights the importance of, of work to address <clears throat> the equity of how we deliver these services. Um, I also think it's important to remember that one population that is so important and that, uh, I've, that in so many ways is so stigmatized in our care system and our service delivery are people who inject drugs. So um, this slide uh, reminds me to tell you that in the 90s, um, we had over 20,000 people per year who were diagnosed with HIV related to injection drugs. Um, through the miracle of HIV treatment, the miracle of testing, and the miracle of SSPs, and the availability of sterile syringes and other equipment, what we saw was an over 90% de de uh, decrease in the number of humans who were being diagnosed with HIV related to injection drugs. In the last few years, we've seen a plateauing. And that plateauing is at least partially driven by outbreaks that are happening in communities. And I'll tell you, um, I had the opportunity to be involved with one in Charleston, West Virginia, and the important work of identifying uh, clusters of uh, people living with HIV is so important because it is about people. It's about individuals who are not getting the services that they need, who are on the fringe of those services, and really identifying these, these uh, groups of people allow us uh, to work with local jurisdictions to use the tools that work, testing, treatment, 
prep, and let's not forget core comprehensive syringe service programs that really allow us to interrupt transmission and uh, again, bring us into that elite control of the epidemic, even among people who inject drugs. It's important again to remember that HIV does not stand alone. And so that prior slide, um, I should also say, um, very often when we see HIV, there's also a high number of humans who are getting diagnosed with viral hepatitis. These syndemics are, are working uh, together and we have to work in a more cohesive fashion to be able to address the syndemics um, rather than just focus on HIV or viral hepatitis. Um, this is another example of, of syndemics. So this shows um, the race and ethnicity of individuals, male and female, who are being diagnosed with syphilis, primary and secondary. That's the early infectious stages. And you'll see that, um, that there is a very clear race disparity as well. STDs are associated with a two-time increase in acquisition and transmission of HIV. Recent data says that 10% of new HIV infections can be attributed to those STDs. It's important to also remember the epidemiology that about half of men diagnosed with syphilis have HIV. And uh, it's important to remember every time we test for an STD or an STI, we will decrease new HIV infections by identifying someone, treating them, and also offering them either HIV treatment or prevention treatment, depending on, uh, on their situation. This is where I take a step back and say, um, it's important for HIV to really evolve and realize that we can't always be the diva in the room. Sometimes we have to be the background dancer. And working with these syndemics, it's critical that HIV support the work of other areas and other infections that drive our, our, uh, our epidemiology. And that includes, with great certainty, uh, drug user health, viral hepatitis, and STI. At its core, I go back to what I said at the beginning. Stigma, housing insecurity, and systemic racism can influence how people access HIV prevention and treatment services. We cannot address HIV without addressing the drivers. We cannot uh, create programs without creating programs that uh, need to strive to be anti-racist, anti-sexist, and address both homophobia and transphobia. So again, critical pieces of our work together. So where are we? Uh, let's talk about the, H the Ending the HIV Epidemic uh, Initiative. So I'll remind you that, um, that this is a, a single initiative, but the work that is generated from there really tracks very closely to the work of the Division of HIV AIDS Prevention and really our work as, uh, as a nation, both uh, governmental as well in the, as in the advocacy world to address testing more, treating more, preventing more, and interrupting transmission. So all of those things are core elements of EAG. But let's tell you where we are with the initiative. So I won't go back to the beginning, but I'll talk a little bit about the funding and the work that we've done on the ground with our partners. Um, so you can see in June, um, we jump-started some jurisdictions, specifically Baltimore, DeKalb County, uh, East Baton Rouge. Uh, so we'll talk more about a couple of those in a moment. Um, there were visits to our jurisdictions that were focusing on EHE. There's, uh, there's uh, several jurisdictions representing about two thirds of uh, people of color living with HIV. Um, subsequently, um, there was work to uh, increase uh, um, planning. And in September 2019, CDC awarded funds to develop multi-year community tailored plans and really with the goal of trying to bring new voices to the table. Then August was really busy. So finally, all of the ideas that uh, came together uh, with EHE resulted in money being uh, sent out of CDC to focus on work in the jurisdictions uh, that were identified for this initiative. So $109 million went to 32 states and local health departments that represented the 57 EHE jurisdictions. And this was really designed to create some new innovations uh, and uh, in, in extend the work and fill the gaps that may not have been filled by uh, prior funding opportunities. Uh, subsequently, uh, there was funding that went to uh, both national STD prevention training centers uh, to uh, provide technical assistance to scale up HIV services, as well as for technical assistance uh, to providers and to other uh, to, to our uh, grantees to make sure that we were able to uh, move the work further. Um, additionally, 
Um, another very important innovation, uh, which was at least partially driven by COVID and the need for figuring out how to continue testing work even uh, during the uh, pause that a lot of care went to was the award of $2 million from the HHS Minority HIV AIDS Fund for ma mass mailing of HIV uh, self-test kits to transgender women and other racial ethnic minority communities. So really important. And this is really launched with a, with a uh, sort of great gusto. We uh, have about 100,000 tests that we expect to give out before World uh, Testing Day in June. So uh, really exciting and a, a strategy that I, that I hope uh, will persist even after COVID is, is done. We continue to work in uh, October to increase staffing um, on the ground uh, to local jurisdictions. And then ultimately, um, the fruition of, of that initial funding uh, that th was designed to do planning was that jurisdictions submitted revised jurisdictional plans to us, and they're currently under review by us as well as by HRSA. And so um, we will also, uh, many of them are also available online uh, at the individual jurisdictions web pages. So if you haven't taken a look, take a look at where you live. Um, the, many of these are posted. So what is the ending the HIV approach? So I'll say again, this is really has been the core of uh, CDC's work uh, before EHE existed. And that is making testing simple, accessible, and routine. Linking people to HIV care because we know treatment is great for you because it keeps you healthy and it has this fabulous side effect of preventing transmission of HIV. So by keeping people living with HIV healthy, um, we can prevent transmission. You can call it treatment as prevention. You can call it U equals U. The notion is that if you treat, you prevent. So it's great. But for people who are not living with HIV, but who potentially could be exposed, we have our third strategy, which is pre-exposure prophylaxis plus syringe service programs. So these are two strategies that allow uh, for individuals to take control of their own prevention and uh, to either go on, uh, on uh, medication to prevent HIV and or to access sterile equipment uh, where they are needed and permitted by law to prevent transmission of HIV through uh, shared uh, equipment for, uh, for injection drugs. Additionally, uh, important work to make sure that we, uh, we find the groups of people who are at the leading edge of the HIV epidemic and make sure that they're getting services and, uh, and testing, treatment, prevention, uh, and SSPs if necessary uh, to really interrupt clusters that are growing in the community. I wanna give a couple of examples. So first I'll show a lovely photo um, of the DeKalb County uh, team that uh, was given uh, resources through the jumpstart piece of ending the HIV epidemic to really establish nursing protocols and other strategies to improve testing and pre-exposure prophylaxis. And I'll also show you this lovely team from East Baton Rouge, Paris, Louisiana of community health workers um, who actually brought prevention services out in the community. And you can read the lovely quotes from both to the group. So really a lot of work going on in on the space and really exciting to see um, some, of, some of these on the ground uh, launching um, really early on in EHE. So I'll move on to talking about uh, opportunities, budget and priorities. So I think it's, there are several areas in which we continue to work to address disparities. One that has been a longstanding area of work is HIV criminalization. So um, having been a really important resource to the, uh, to the Department of Justice and others to really uh, push toward, uh, toward modernization of, of laws that relate to criminalization, um, we recently published in January 2021, a commentary in Lancet that really encourages states to uh, listen to the science and revise their laws or the application of these laws for the sake of people living with HIV. I already told you about the self-testing and this time I'll also include the web address together.takemehome.org, which is how we uh, uh, are, are harnessing these 100,000 tests to be able to get them out to the community. And I, as I said, I expect that will be done uh, well before June, but at least by June for World Testing Day with that first round of, uh, of uh, testing kits. Um, we continue to do very important work at our core. Um, one is funding our community-based organization. So um, uh, the $42 million were awarded up per year to 90 CBOs serving populations affected by HIV. And so um, 
that will continue to happen and provides us the opportunity to really reach deeper into the community than we can through some of our other strategies. And speaking of equity, one of the really uh, important programs uh, or NOFOs that we continue to fund um, uh, is the uh, Comprehensive High Impact Prevention Projects for young men of color who have sex with men and young transgender persons of color. So this is really an example of equity work uh, at its uh, um, in action, which is really focusing on the populations who are overrepresented uh, and who are under uh, in, the, in the epidemic, but underrepresented in services to try to boost them to the place where they're able to access services. And the hope is to really achieve a point of justice with the work as opposed to just equity. So really important work happening across the board. And again, uh, it, this is one of those that, that takes a village. So both from the perspective of public health, but also from the perspective of advocacy, our synergy to work together to make sure that such work continues is critical. Now, an exciting uh, thing that's happening now is also the launch of the National HIV Strategic Plan, and this covers 2021 to 2025. So it pro provides us opportunities to work uh, in a different way with federal agencies that are not involved uh, in EHE so that, to reach our goals. So not only focusing on the 57 jurisdictions, this is a national plan, and we're excited to, to take next, next steps um, to be able to work with others to implement the vision. One exciting part of the vision um, is the, uh, uh, the uh, status neutral approach to HIV services. So um, that, that comes a bit from my history and is one of the uh, sort of strategies that used to demonstrate and to work in, uh, in one jurisdiction to identify ways to address the zero divide. So what I mean by that is the, uh, the, uh, the schism, the sort of break created by systems between people living with HIV and those who could benefit from PrEP. So um, as a doctor taking care of people living with HIV uh, and, and providing pre-exposure prophylaxis, I couldn't tell the difference between someone living with HIV and PrEP in care or service. So I, it was unclear to me why, uh, why systems were being created that, uh, that, that, uh, that silo the care in a way uh, that create inefficiencies and also that maintain some of the stigma um, that has been such a, a, a barrier to the work in HIV. So it all starts with that HIV test, whether it's negative or positive, people can enter a continuum of care and um, that leads to uh, engagement, whether it's for treatment or prevention. The engine that fuels uh, engagement is high quality care and services, whether it's for someone living with HIV or someone who's at risk. If they are in high quality care and they're living with HIV, they should go on medicines and that results in viral load suppression and their health, as well as that side effect I talked about, prevention to, of transmission. If they're HIV negative uh, and they could benefit from PrEP, they should go on PrEP. And that means that they're very unlikely to get HIV. When you put all this together, it just says that the person living with HIV and the person who could benefit from PrEP and prevention services are the same person. They're not different. So really the goal is as we implement this new national strategy to use this as a guiding force, as a guiding principle to be able to address some of the longstanding inequities related to status. And again, I will, uh, I will tell my story again of HIV not always having to be the diva, but sometimes being the background dancer, because the work that we're seeing in STIs and hepatitis support the work in HIV. So the more that we can synergize and work together across not only infectious disease lines, but also uh, social services lines from the perspective of mental health delivery, other social determinants of health and health equity in general, the better we're going to be able to do uh, leverage uh, to leverage both sides and all sides of the work to be able to achieve that goal of elite pandemic control, or as um, folks like to call it, ending the HIV epidemic. Now, it takes resources to do that. And so I want to give you uh, a view as to what our modeling has been compared to what the resources are that we're getting. So um, you can see that in year one of the, ending the, the, the HIV epidemic initiative, <clears throat> CDC received about $140 million. Year two, $271 million were requested and uh, we, we were given 175 million. Again, 35 million is nothing to sneeze at. It is a great way to continue the work going forward. But from the perspective of resources, the more resources we have, the more likely we're able to achieve our goals and to achieve them um, on, our, on a time scale that is uh, in line with, our, with the vision. So really an important uh, lesson uh, from the perspective of ending the HIV epidemic is that resources are critical to be able to achieve the goal. Now, it's also important to remember that um, we're really proud at CDC 
that, uh, that about 89% of our funding is directed to state and local health departments, CBOs, local education agencies, and other organizations. So that means that um, of the money that rolls into DHAP, 89% goes out the door. And that's so critical because that's who does the work. And so again, really important to remember that when we're, when, when we're talking about resources, it's not just for DHAP, it's for, for us um, as we sort of push it out into the community uh, and to other environments in healthcare. So in terms of priorities, I think it's pretty clear that we cannot end HIV or address HIV without being even more focused on equity. So we're looking at equity, not only from the perspective of the work that we're doing on the outside, but also looking internally at DHAP to make sure that we are really representing our community and the community that we are working with. So looking at our, our workplace, as well as looking externally at how we can even better, be even better at identifying opportunities to uh, increase equity using our, our funding opportunities. Um, we will continue to work on expanding self-testing efforts. Again, COVID had an impact and sometimes things, are, things that came out of COVID can be good and some things they can be, sometimes they can be bad. Self-testing is an example of something wonderful as are uh, visits that use telemedicine. So uh, we will continue to work to expand self-testing efforts to be able to reach people who otherwise may not be tested for HIV, even not during a pandemic. We will continue to strengthen syndemic collaborations, again, remembering that the work of STI, of sexually transmitted infections, and the work of viral hepatitis, mental health, um, drug user health, et cetera, all serve the purpose of achieving HIV control. And so it's, it's not about it being, being a solo HIV show. It's really about that team effort and finding out ways that we can be more efficient and smart in the way that we deliver service. Uh, and really focusing on that end user because people on the street don't care if HIV supports it or STD supports it or viral hep supports it, they just want services. And then finally, uh, we are going to really take, uh, uh, take our strategy of status neutral into account and really celebrate its inclusion in the national strategy to identify ways that we can make it clear that we should not be making two doors, one for people living with HIV and another for those who could benefit from PrEP. But our job is to bring one door together so we can treat people and service people rather than servicing a status of, of a, sing, a little blood test that you get in the lab. So it's about people and not about the results. And just wanted to end with a couple of really important uh, policy issues that I'm sure you're going to hear a lot more about as you take your voyage through AIDS Watch. Um, as you heard from Jesse and others, making healthcare accessible is critical. If we're working in biomedical space to be able to prevent and treat HIV, you got to be able to get those interventions or they don't matter. We have to continuously work on structural barriers, and that means racism, sexism, homophobia, and all of the other social determinants of health that are so critical in making sure that people can prioritize their HIV-related health, whether it's sexual or drug user-related health, so we can actually uh, get our message out as well as our services. We need to uh, continue to have uh, advocacy on the local and national level around modernizing HIV criminalization laws. Uh, expanding practitioner scope of practice so we can better use pharmacies, nurses, and other practitioners to provide uh, interventions such as treatment and PrEP, and cannot forget uh, critical to support comprehensive syringe service programs since they are such an important piece of not only delivering sterile uh, sterile injection equipment, but also HIV-related services as well as services uh, for drug treatment. So I want to take us back to, 40, uh, to a little bit less than 40 years ago, but let's go a little bit further back and think about the HIV epidemic and, and where we've been and where we're going. So um, I think that in this world, um, not only are we going to be able once again, I think, to take to the streets, but for now we got to take to the internet. So the work that you're doing, even in this virtual space, is so critical. Um, and I think um, the, the, what you will learn today is that every conversation, every outreach that you conduct is a part of making HIV history. So I want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank AIDS Watch for having me here. And uh, I hope that you have a wonderful and productive meeting. And I'll end with this. We do have this opportunity. We can't squander it. So let's continue to do that, work together to end America's HIV epidemic. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitri. Man, you rock.
We are so grateful that you were able to join us for AIDS Watch, and we send you our best wishes and congratulations for the important roles that you play for all of us, because we know that your partnership with us and with our community means that you are keeping our voices foremost as you work to end the HIV epidemic and also as in your new role as you help to address the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you, Dimitri. Thank you so much. We really Thank you. Your partnership is important to us. And have a wonderful, wonderful meeting. I appreciate, thank you for having me. Have a wonderful day. All right, man, thank you. Right. Thank you. you rock. You rock, talk to you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs> and, and now we wanna move on to a, a very important part of every AIDS Watch, and that's our training and guidance on sharing our stories, which is a critical component of our advocacy as we go into meeting with Congress and to the administration, sharing our stories can make a huge impact. And we have two people who are living with HIV who have made great impacts by doing just that, by sharing their stories. Dr. Carrie Foote, who's chair of the HIV Modernization Movement for Indiana, and Malcolm Reed, who's director of programs at Thrive SS in Atlanta, and he's the chair for federal policy for the US people living with HIV caucus. So welcome, Carrie, and welcome, Malcolm. Please help us share our story. Thank you, Jesse, um, and thank you to all the amazing staff at AIDS United, um, the PLHIV caucus. Um, we're so excited to be here um, to share with you our kind of words of wisdom, sharing our stories. Um, I wanna remind everyone, if you have questions for us, please put them in the Q&A and we'll try to allow time um, to, to answer your questions at the end. Um, but this is really exciting. One of the most exciting parts of AIDS Watch is not only meeting your fellow advocates and all the amazing folks um, who attend AIDS Watch, but it's the opportunity to share our stories because our voices matter, our, story, our stories matter, and they can actually really truly make a difference and make a change and lead to legislative um, better outcomes. So first, what you want to think about is what can you expect when you meet with your legislator here at AIDS Watch, you know, um, whether it's here or you go, you know, in your local communities that you're meeting. So at AIDS Watch, normally and everywhere, you're just going to really probably meet with your legislative aides. Um, if you're fortunate, you might get to meet the legislator, um, but don't worry about that because your legislative aide is your friend. Um, they basically are the eyes and ears for your legislator. So you normally will meet with them. The meetings are super short, um, anywhere from like 15 minutes to 30 minutes per legislator. So you don't have a lot of time, especially if you have a large delegation. If the meetings are in person, if we were in DC, you might be meeting in the hallways, you might be meeting in their conference room, lobby wait areas. Um, you don't really know where you're gonna meet. It just depends upon what kind of space is available and how many people are on your team. Of course, this year, we're all gonna be meeting, for those of us meeting on Wednesday, it's going to be virtual in a virtual space. Um, everyone on the particular state will meet with their state senators. Those will be larger meetings and an opportunity to say, hey, we care about this issue. Look how many of us from our state came to show up at AIDS Watch to share with you our stories and what's important to us. The representative meetings for district members will be much smaller um, there. So when you go into your meetings, what are tips for effective meetings? Number one, know your issue. So at AIDS Watch, there's multiple policy briefs that they're going to talk about later today. Learn about those, learn what bills and legislation is associated with those so you know what to ask for when you're done sharing your story. Um, practice telling your story. Sometimes you may be a little bit nervous about it. You might worry you're going too long, um, but just practice it and know that it's your story and your story is powerful and no one can tell it better than you. Um, but practice telling it so you kind of get it like, okay, I've got it down, I'm within two minutes. And then with your team, you wanna plan an agenda with your delegation before the meeting. And there will be time throughout AIDS Watch later today during the um, the, the, the session that you're all required to go to if you're gonna have meetings. We'll talk about agenda planning, then there's various breaks throughout the meetings that you could take to meet with your team to plan an agenda. 
who will share their story? What particular ask are you going to ask for um, in relation to the different policies that we're all advocating on? What order will you go into? Recognize the time constraints. Very important, center the voices of the most impacted, right, in your state. So of course, people living with HIV, but among us, as we just saw in the previous presentation, there's all these disparities on who is most impacted living with HIV. It's important to try to elevate and center those voices. So for example, people who are black, people who inject drugs, sex workers, make sure to center those voices on your team so that they have the opportunity to share their powerful stories. Um, if you have in the Senate meetings and you have diversity throughout your state, share regional stories. When you're done, you always want to leave a packet of material and information. Don't worry about all the details in the meeting. Share your story, leave the information and the policy briefs with them. Um, AIDS United will be doing all that for us. When you're talking to the legislator, some quick kind of do's and don'ts. Do's always use their correct title, you know, so Senator um, Hill, Representative Carson, be professional, courteous, direct, concise, factual, be credible. Um, there's no one more credible than you with your story. You are the expert subject matter because you have lived it. It's okay if you're a little bit nervous to read a prepared short statement, that's perfectly fine. And um, that also kind of keeps you on track and you don't forget anything. Say you are a constituent if you're, you know, representative meetings that you live in their district. Um, share your personal story of connection to the issue. Again, your story matters. If by email you can be visual, share a photo of yourself or your team. Um, take pictures during the meeting. That's kind of powerful. And then when you return back home, you can follow up with an email and remind them of the issue, remind them of your story, share a picture that you took during the meeting, and that'll trigger, oh, I remember those folks from my, my state. Um, and then ask for an email so you can follow up to remind them of the issue and future communications. So I'll turn it over to Malcolm now. So hi, once again, I'm Malcolm Reed from Thrive SS. I'm also the Fed Policy Chair for the US People Living with HIV Caucus. So let's talk about the don'ts. Well, the first don't is don't be negative. Have a positive attitude as you're talking to your representative, irrespective of what party they're from. Don't lie, don't exaggerate, don't use jargon or give inaccurate information. If you don't have the answer, tell them you don't and you'll find out and you'll get back to them. And that's a good time to say, you know what? Let me get back to you and then let me be your HIV resource in your district. Don't be long-winded. Tell your story succinctly, quickly. As we mentioned, practice, have an elevator speech so that you can be quick and get to the point. Steer, don't steer away from the issue. Stay with the AIDS Watch policy brief issues that you'll be given later today. Avoid statistics, but engage in your storytelling. Make sure that your story is passionate and palatable. Don't fail to find out where the bill is in the legislative process. This is very important. Do some preparation before you go to the meeting. Make sure you know what bills you, you want to talk about and where they are in the legislative process. Are they in the Senate? Are they in the House? What stage are they in the House? This affects who you want to contact in the legislative process. And finally, don't give up. Advocacy and activism are a marathon, not a sprint. So don't give up, but always have fun and go in there knowing that you are going to make a difference. So let me give you an example. I live in the state of Georgia. My representative, uh, my senator is Raphael Warnock. So I'm gonna tell him my story. But remember, as Carrie said, when telling a Senate, when telling your story to a senator, you wanna make sure that you are very brief because the constituency is larger. The people in the room with you are gonna be much, uh, there's gonna be more people in the room with you. So you have to be quick. Pick the people that you want to talk and make sure that those points are important. But tell it in a way of who, why, what. Who am I? Why am I here? And why is this issue important to me? 
and what I want you to do. So who are you? Um, be passionate when you tell about, talk about the issue and then ask them to do something. Ask them to make a vote. Ask them to lobby for your issue. As I mentioned, Raphael Warnock is my Senator. So here's how I'm going to approach it. Hello, Senator Warnock. My name is Malcolm Reed. I have been living with HIV for 24 years. I'm 63 years old and I live in Decatur with my husband of 23 years. He is also living with HIV. As a person living with HIV and as the director of programs for Thrive Support Services and Atlanta-based CBO, I am very concerned with voting rights in our state. As you know, the Georgia legislature is working a bit on several bills that will cut down on early voting, weekend voting, and other voting restrictions. No weekend voting means no souls to the polls, and you as a pastor know how important that get out the vote strategy is in our community. Our ability to get out the vote is, in, is in very important and imperative in fighting to expand Medicaid in our state, and to modernize HIV criminalization laws. And by the way, Senator Warnock, it's also important to keep you in office in 2022. I need your vote on the For the People Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act because both of these acts together will help to stop the uh, state houses in various states from uh, bringing about unfair voting laws. We need to support the change by filibuster. I need you to talk to your Republican colleagues if you can get them, but if you can't report the, uh, support the changes by filibuster, that will allow the bills to pass with only Democratic votes. Will you do that for us, Senator Warnock? Please, and thank you. And that's how you need to approach it. Quick, succinct, ask for what you want, say please and thank you, always be respectful and make sure that if you can find a little hook in there that's really gonna make them go, find that hook. I know that Raphael Warnock is going to be up for election again in two years, even though he just won because it was a special election. So getting out the vote in Georgia is as important to him as it is to me. And I'll turn it back over to Carrie. Okay, so um, a couple of things that I just thought of um, and when Malcolm was sharing his story there was, you know, remember that these folks, they work for us. A lot of times we feel kind of in intimidated going in and sharing our stories. Um, but the last line, you know, remember, you know, we voted for you. Um, they work for us. And it's important to remind them of that, that, you know, they're there to do a service for the community. And that's why we want to share our stories. And so my story that I'm going to share here is a mix of, you know, my story, I am, I am a woman living with HIV, um, but also uh, I do services and advocacy around HIV criminalization through the HIV Modernization Movement Network. And I kind of share that because a lot of you may not be living with HIV, but you're providing services, or you're doing advocacy for people who are most impacted. And that's your story. So if you're working in housing and providing, you know, HOPWA services and you're having all these challenges, you have a story to share there. So, you know, who am I? So basically, you know, in my story, I would kind of just start off you know, hello, Representative Carson. I am a professor at IUPUI and I'm a woman living with HIV for over 30 years. I lead the HIV modernization movement in Indiana. We are a statewide coalition of providers and people living with HIV seeking to modernize several laws in our state that unjustly criminalize people living with HIV and they pose a barrier to ending the HIV epidemic. And then I transition to my why, why is this important to me? And I just say, well, you know, did you know that Indiana is just one of many states that criminalizes people due to their HIV status? That hundreds of people across the US have been prosecuted under these laws, nearly all in situations where HIV transmission wasn't even possible. For example, a young man from Indiana who has had a successful college career and when he was charged under these harmful HIV criminal laws, he faced a horrific 30 year sentence 
One of my female friends risked violence when she was legally required to share her HIV status with an abusive partner. Every single one of us living with HIV, including myself, could face arrest under these laws. Charges result in felonies, which make it extremely challenging to get work and housing. These laws have no public health benefit. They lead to unjust prosecutions, especially for disenfranchised groups such as racial minorities. To treat us differently because we have HIV only reinforces the HIV stigma that poses a huge barrier to HIV testing, treatment, and care. And then I transition to my what, and I, it's very simple. Can we count on you to help us remove these harmful laws and get us closer to ending the HIV epidemic? Will you support the Repeal HIV Discrimination Act? Thank you for your time. So in closing, you know, basically we just wanna really emphasize that all of you have a story to tell and each of you, your stories matter and they can make a difference. Our stories are powerful. Together we can end the HIV epidemic in the US and ensure that those of us living with and most vulnerable to HIV can thrive. Um, so with that, we do have some time. If anybody has some questions for us, we'd, be, we'd love to answer them. Yeah, are there any questions in the chat box? Again, while we're waiting for questions, I do just want to um, emphasize that there will be some sessions tonight or a session tonight at 6.15, I believe, with Soapbox. And Soapbox will um, tell you where you're supposed to be um, as far as uh, who, you, who you're going to be talking to on Wednesday. And um, I'm also sure that you will get the policy briefs um, once they're read in this session. So study the policy briefs, that's very important. Make sure you understand what the policies are that we're fighting for, and then you can speak to those policies. So take some time tomorrow um, in between sessions to look at the policy briefs, read them, figure out what you wanna talk about, and then talk to your state lead. So I see there's a question, Malcolm. What For us, what are some things you want to steer clear of um, again, I'm not sure, you know, you, you want to stick to your, your issue that you're advocating on. So when you go into these meetings and you share your story, your team will kind of identify, okay, you, you're going to focus on criminalization. You're going to focus on other civil rights. Um, you're going to focus on appropriations and funding. You're going to focus on sex education. Um, so try to just, you know, kind of, kind of stay in your lane on your issue and stick to that. Um, and then I would say steer clear of just going back to the don'ts, you know, don't be negative, always be positive, walk into those meetings, seeing every legislator is a potential ally willing to, to do better in terms of their laws and advocacy, and they're there to learn from you. Um, so just go in there with a positive attitude. Uh, Malcolm, exactly. I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah, no, I don't have anything to add. You just want to be positive and you want to make sure that that you are working with your state lead and, and the other folks in your state um, to make sure that you guys are in sync with the issues that you wanna talk about. I think somebody put in there, are the, are the meetings Tuesday or Wednesday? They are Wednesday. Tomorrow there are breakout sessions um, that you can go to and you'll get a schedule for that. And then another question I see in the Q&A, will you be forwarding bill stage information for bills included in the policy platforms? Um, I, I know that um, the policy briefs are, are posted. I'm not sure if they say exactly where they are in the process, but those are great questions as we're just starting AIDS Watch. Ask your team. Somebody will know who's really actively involved in the different issues to find out where they are and kind of save you the trouble of going on the internet um, to kind of dig up that information. There's an incredible, incredible wealth of information of the folks who attend um, who attends AIDS Watch and everyone is so willing to help, so willing to you know, guide you along the way. So don't hesitate to just reach out and ask. So there's another question that just popped up. How do I find the team for, um, for Ohio? So I don't know if you, when you registered for AIDS Watch, if you said you wanted to go to the Hill visits. If you did, you should have received an email from Soapbox with your schedule. And in that, when you click on that link, it has the team that you'll be um, paired with. 
So take a look to see if you have that information. If you don't, um, I guess we can get you in touch with somebody from um, Age United or Soapbox. Um, that's from Mon uh, Mona Hurst from Ohio that's trying to get him. So Mo um, Mona, I don't know if you, you know, receive your email or not from Soapbox, but if not, um, reach out to somebody. And I think somebody asked if today's meeting was mandatory. Um, um, I presume that refers to the Soapbox meeting. For folks yeah. who want to attend the, the uh, legislative meeting visits on Wednesday, my understanding is it is mandatory. And it's really important because they're going to walk through the whole process, how to use the technology to do these virtual visits. It can be, you know, for me, you know, I need to rely on my 18 year old to understand all this technology sometimes. So it's um, really good to go there as well. It'll reduce some anxiety, especially for, for the new advocates. And even if you can't attend um, the, the meetings on Wednesday, um, it's still valuable to go, th go to because you'll kind of learn how that's done for the next time when you can maybe attend meetings in the future at a future AIDS watch. Yeah, and that's important because next year, let's pray that we are meeting in person and you can look at your schedule and see all these wonderful people from, from around your state that you will be meeting your representative with. That was always very fun when we were doing this in person. So another question, how should we respond to a staff person who is unfriendly or even hostile to our agenda? My, like my mother used to tell me, kill them with kindness. You never want to be rude in kind. You want to tell them what you would like to talk to your representative and you want to make sure that they understand why you're there. And if they're, if they're that rude, you hand them the, the, the policy briefs and then, hey, I would try to make sure that when my Senator or my Congressperson is in district, I would pay a visit to their office at that time. You may run into that same aid, but you may not. Um, but it's always killing with kindness. You never respond in kind to rudeness. And I would just add to that again, it's you know one thing I've learned, um, you know, we're all very passionate too. And sometimes our passion comes off as anger for people who aren't ready to hear, you know, who aren't ready to change or do better with their policies. Um, so even then, I, I, you know, I find sometimes I've got to tone down my passion and get it a little bit, you know, because it will be interpreted differently in different places. Um, and always just see, um, you know, another important point, you know, that Malcolm made was this advocacy activism. It's a marathon, not a sprint. We're, we may not be able to change, you know, folks and get them to support an issue overnight. Um, you know, it takes time to change hearts and minds sometimes. And just little by little, you know, you just start, you know, sharing your story, educating about HIV and where we're at, and then share this amazing work that we can end the HIV epidemic and we need your help to get there. And you can help us do this in our state. Look at the amazing things that we're doing. And then at the end, also invite them, invite them to your organizations if you work for some. So if you work for a great place, um, you know, say, hey, when you're back in, you know, you're back home, you know, in Indiana, come check out the BU Wellness Network and the great work that we're doing in the great state of Indiana to end the HIV epidemic. And then, you know, they might just take you up on that offer. Invite them to your, you know, state AIDS walks, your local AIDS walks, um, to join those efforts so they can learn more than when they're back home, actually on the ground in your states. And like I said earlier, you could theoretically end up being their HIV expert. Somebody when they're when they've got a question about HIV, they might call you. So so look for that. Um, so the questions are coming in fast in the chat box. I don't know if I missed some. Um, I thought I saw one from Nora. I want to try to go, go back up to that one. Policy briefs are on the um, the AIDS United website, the AIDS Watch. Um, they're all there, nicely right. organized. <laughs> Um, for the folk, the person who asked that. Hey, Nora, if you don't mind coming off mute, I saw a question from you and I can't find it, but I thought I, I remember when I saw it, I wanted to answer it. Sure. We had a question in the Q and A. How is best for the legis for the advocacy team to follow up with the offices after the meeting? 
one thing that I do, um, I'm not sure if this is best, but one thing that I do is when I get back home, I send a thank you note. Um, um, I think Barb mentioned this on the Wednesday New Advocate training session. Um, I, I handwrite a thank you note. And I know I'm, I'm an old guy, so I handwrite stuff and I didn't send a text or a tweet or whatever, but I did. I, hand, I used to handwrite notes and, and, and send them back. But I'm, I suppose you could send a tweet or send an email um, thanking them. And Carrie mentioned it in, in her section when she said, take a picture and then send that to them with the email so that they remember you. Carrie? Yeah, and so what I try to do as um, the state lead is I try to um, send one email, kind of a group, thank you for meeting with us for both of the senators. Um, and then I try, if we were at AIDS Watch, I would have included a picture. And then I would have included an ask just to remind them, because sometimes they don't follow up on the ask. And I'll just give you an example. Um, Congressman Carson is amazing, um, you know, an angel here in Indiana amazingly great work um, that he does in Congress. Um, each time I've been at AIDS Watch, I've asked him to co-sponsor the Repeal Act. Each time his office has said, yes, we will. <laughs> they still haven't signed it. So this time I'm really gonna hold them accountable and say, you know what, you've told us twice. And sometimes it's not intentional, they're busy. They're super busy. Um, so those reminders, doing, doing them politely, hey, we met with you, you made this commitment to support this issue. Um, make it easy for them. Here's the, the, the particular, you know, send a link on the act that you're asking them to support that they said they would support, add their name to the bill and that sort of thing and follow up. So you can do it in different ways, but everyone is, you know, you could just reach out, just say, thank you. It was wonderful meeting you. Um, and, you know, and the pictures are great because pictures help tell your story and help them remember that. I see somebody has 63 people signed up. Whoa, what state is that? Awesome for your Senate meetings. That is incredible. But that's a, a, that's a lot of people in your Senate meeting. Team meetings for your, um, they're supposed to take place on Wednesday and um, you, somebody should be notified about that. Um, be in touch with you. If you attend the meeting tonight, you'll probably get an alert on when your meetings are but um, AIDS United has staff who's working to be in touch with all the folks who are attending the meetings on Wednesday. But that's awesome, who, whatever state that is. Yeah. I want to know. <laughs> and every state has a state lead. So that person hopefully will reach out to you um, and, and, and work with you to get the meeting set up and make sure that, um, that they're featuring certain stories and, 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 and picking the people who are going to speak. What else do we have in the chat box? Let's see. What do you do if you have an issue with your state lead? Hmm. Hmm. Good question. Um, yeah, I don't, hmm. I don't know that I have an answer for that. Um, well, I could try. I would say I'm a big um, fan of communication and sharing. If you're uncomfortable with something or if you have an issue, um, first try to talk to the person themselves with whatever that issue might be. Um, three quarters of the time, you'll resolve the issue right there. Um, and the person's like, oh my gosh, I, why we can fix this. Um, and then if you can't, um, you could talk to AIDS United, you could try something else. Um, and, and you'll get your own, I would just say for these meetings, sometimes we do have concerns and challenges working with our fellow advocates and that sort of thing. Um, and we just have to find a way to keep our eye on the prize that we all have a common goal here where we're trying to end the HIV epidemic. We're all trying to do better. All of us can do better. And sometimes when we come into these meetings, don't bring those, those issues and those differences into the meeting themselves. Just try to resolve them outside the meeting and that sort of thing. But try, it's never easy, but try to first work it out with the lead themselves because you might be pleasantly surprised and it could get worked out right there. A lot of times people are intimidated or they don't want to bring it up or they're like, oh, this isn't going to get fixed, but you never know unless you ask. Yeah. Uh, Angel Soto said in the chat, address it kindly and calmly. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's it. Um, chat box is moving very quickly. Um, let's see. And state leads are kind of, we're just here, um, like I'm a state lead, we're just here to kind of facilitate, to help guide new advocates, particularly on 
you know, what is this all about? What are we doing here at AIDS Watch? You know, what do we do in these legislative meetings um, and, and that sort of thing? And, you know, just, just kind of go along and hopefully, you know, it'll be a great experience for everybody. So William Scott uh, Daly says, who do we ask who our state team leader is? Once again, you should have an email from Soapbox um, if you signed up and said that you were going to be attending the um, um, Hill visits, then you should have an email from Soapbox and it will have a link and it has your schedule and it has who your state team is and it identifies who your state lead is. So if you don't have that, reach out to somebody on the AIDS United side and they'll put you in touch with Soapbox and um, um, so that we can get you in and then you have to come to that meeting tonight. For the, what do we do if someone in our group says something that is incorrect during the meeting? Um, keep in mind, just context, these, these meetings are really short. They're really fast. You're gonna get in there. You're gonna probably meet with the legislative aide. Um, maybe the legislator, um, if it's a legislative aide, they'll normally have a piece of paper and a pen and they're gonna be writing really fast and taking lots of notes and they're barely gonna be able to capture anything. That's why it's also important to, lead, to have that packet of information that AIDS United is taking the lead on that and making sure that they all get the policy briefs. Um, and then they'll hear your stories, which will stick because stories stick with us, right? Because they are powerful. Um, and if somebody says something inaccurate about a bill or something, I would not really draw attention to it in the meeting. There's just not enough time. And the legislative um, person you're meeting with probably won't even retain that. But afterwards, you can kind of use it as a, you know, just a teachable moment. Hey, you know, this wasn't quite correct, you know, you, you know, and, and just, just fix it for the next time you go around. Or if you follow up in, in an email to thank them when, when you're done with your meetings, you could correct the information there, give them the correct information that is in writing or text or a thank you letter there. But I would not necessarily correct it in the meeting. There's just not enough time. The legislative aid, they don't really know the issues the way that we do. So they're not getting all those subtle nuances and details where somebody might say something um, inaccurate in a meeting, which can very well happen. We all do it, you know, um, so. Right. So we only have a minute left. I'll, I'll close by saying with we thank you all for being here. Those of you who've been here before and those of you who are new, this is an awesome opportunity to get our stories, our collective HIV stories out there. And um, we are really proud to be here to help you guys through it. If you have any other questions, there's a lot of folks on this call who have been um, in this position before, in at AIDS Watch before, many of them in your state. So find somebody in your state that might know, know the answers to some of the questions. And if you don't get the answers, come to the meeting tonight with Soapbox and um, the sessions tomorrow and network with people. That's the other thing about AIDS Watch. It's a great networking opportunity. So network with people to get the answers that you need. So thank you very much. And thank you. Back. <laughs> All right, everybody, thanks. We're gonna turn it over to Marianne. Thank you so much, Malcolm and Carrie. And hello again, everyone. My name is Marianne and it's great to speak with everyone again. We're gonna spend the, uh, some time now uh, following Malcolm's suggestion to know the issue to go through the digital AIDS Watch folder and review the briefs that we have prepared for the Wednesday meetings with members of Congress. Our panel today will include myself, Kamaria Laffrey from the CERO Project, Victoria Rodriguez Roldan from AIDS United, Carl Bologna Jr. from AIDS United. And as we go to the next slide, we'll start with Kamaria, who will talk about the civil and human rights brief. Then we will review the access to healthcare brief, the sexual wellness, the sorry, the appropriation, appropriations brief, and then the sexual wellness and reproductive rights brief. Whitney Thomas has dropped the links to the English and Spanish briefs in the chat. And we encourage folks who have questions to use the Q&A box to ask questions. I will ask our panelists to keep an eye out on that Q&A box throughout the panel and invite them to either answer, um, answer via the Q&A box and type out an answer 
or if we have time, um, I'll ask them to add a couple thoughts at the end of the panel. So now, without further ado, we can move to the next slide and I'll hand the mic over to Kamaria. Hello, everyone. I'm Kamaria Laffrey, she, her pronouns. Um, just first want to say big props to AIDS United for language justice and access with our Spanish and ASL interpretation, another form of what civil and human rights can lend to equity. As we all know, the previous administration did so much damage to the cause of civil and human rights. We are seeing the uprising of marginalized communities crying out for this new administration to do better. But what does that look like? I would be remiss before I go into the brief if I didn't acknowledge that we must hold the administration accountable and the protections against violence experienced by racially marginalized groups at the hands of white supremacy and apathy to privilege. Recent news coverage of the violence inflicted on our Asian American and Pacific Islander communities highlights that. This is not new and there are opportunities to overturn outdated policies that, this, that support this violence. Our communities experience much harm that does not go televised or broadcast in the news. So our ask to do better look like the following few things. It looks like protections of the rights of all racial and ethnic groups by making protecting voting rights a well-publicized priority in the necessary agencies and departments as we pass the For the People Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. We saw what voter suppression attempts have done. And as of January this year, more than 20 states have um, proposed policies that restrict access to voting in one way or another, and we must do better. We also need protections to the rights and privacy of all people living with HIV and enact legislation aimed at the repeal of HIV criminalization laws. We need this administration to take meaningful steps in the protections of all members of the LGBTQ plus community by passing the Equality Act and in recognizing and protecting the rights of sex workers by passing the Safe Sex Workers Study Act which will investigate the harms of previous policies through FOSTA-SESTA laws. We must also be alert and fight the passage of the Earn It Act that incentivizes private internet platforms um, and surveillance and censoring the public. We also need to ensure the protections for the transgender community by amending existing laws and ensuring future laws explicitly include people of transgender experience and critical and meaningful funding opportunities, non-discrimination protections, and community served and not tokenizing them. Last listed and not least in our continuous fight for the civil and human rights of people is to pass the US Citizenship Act of 2021 to protect the rights of immigrant communities and those seeking asylum with broadened reforms that bring justices to the thousands harmed displaced and prosecuted under the previous harmful administration. We have a lot of work ahead of us, folks. Please, in this next few days, um, I've seen in the comments that folks are feeling overwhelmed. Take care of yourselves. Drink water, breathe, rely on your community. We are all in this together. Um, this advocacy that we're taking part in over the next few days is another form of self-care. We are utilizing our power of our voice, and I am so proud to be among you all. I will now turn the mic back over to Marianne. Thank you. Thank you, Kamaria. So now we're going to switch over to the access to healthcare brief. As Carrie mentioned earlier, stories stick. And oftentimes, your story will connect directly to one of the requests that are already in these briefs. And so as you begin to think about your story or the ways in which you will support others telling their story in congressional meetings, I wanted to highlight some takeaways from the access to healthcare brief. While there's light on the, uh, on the horizon regarding the COVID-19 pandemic, there are A, so many factors that can undercut progress and B, we aren't even close to fully understanding the long-term impact of having COVID-19 or even the long-term impact of having lived through the pandemic. 
And the pandemic has highlighted the existing deficiencies in our public health system, deficiencies that often have a disproportionate impact on underserved communities. So the first takeaway is ensuring that we have a robust response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And this means supporting vaccine outreach and distribution efforts to people living with HIV, to communities of color, to indigenous nations, and to people with low incomes. We need to make sure that data collection is present, publicly accessible, and includes information like gender identity and race and ethnicity. Policy is often driven by evidence and we should be uniformly uh, collecting data in a way that can call out disparities where disparities exist. And then where the federal government has given flexibility or added funding to Medicaid programs, these changes should be made permanent. Now, secondly, we need to make sure that health and the health insurance marketplace is strengthened and funded. Uh, as Kamaria said, the last four years has just been an attack on so many progressive policies and specifically on healthcare reform. Uh, these, these attacks have made it more difficult for people to access quality, affordable healthcare plans. And so we need substantial funding for navigators to help people understand and pick a plan that works for their health needs. And the navigators who, need, who are funded should be people and organizations who are already part of communities, who have a history of working with underserved communities, and who are already trusted and reliable sources of information. We've also highlighted three specific legislative asks. The Equality Act um, has already been introduced um, and as Kamari said, would explicitly include protections for transgender and gender non-conforming people in several areas of life. We also are asking members of Congress to support the PrEP Access and Coverage Act and the Medically Tailored Home Delivered Meals Demonstration Pilot Act. These acts were introduced in the last congressional session but were not enacted in law and access to PrEP and programs that address the social determinants of health, like medically tailored nutrition services, um, both have important roles in ending the epidemic and represent key areas where members of Congress can lend support. And then finally, we need to make sure that recent shifts in focus to address health equity issues are not just words spoken or task forces that are created and soon forgotten. These initiatives need to be held accountable and given the resources they need to conduct comprehensive reviews of existing policies to root out policies that perpetuate disparities and to continue to strengthen public health infrastructure. Access to healthcare is too often an issue all across the country. And um, if these takeaways didn't quite resonate with your story, but your story highlights issues related to accessing healthcare, please check out the rest of the brief um, to see if you might be able to connect your story uh, to another legislative ask that I didn't mention here. Without further ado, I'll hand over the mic to Carl, who will talk about the appropriations brief. Thank you. Thanks, Marianne. Um, if we can go to the next slide, appropriations. Thank you. So the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted all aspects of our lives, uh, including the lives of people living with HIV. And we're really pleased to see the recent commitments and federal funds to the ending the HIV epidemic, a plan for America. Um, but you know, in this time of increased resources to address the COVID pandemic and a stretched uh, federal um, health response, we so additional resources are sorely needed. We have a few key priorities um, that are critical after years and years of level funding. Um, so the payer of last resort for the HIV program is the Ryan White HIV AIDS program. Uh, we are asking for 2.77 billion. That's an increase of $345 million for the Ryan White program. It is a critical program that only serves people living with HIV. An additional program that is critical and speaks to the social determinants of health 
is a housing opportunities for people with AIDS program. This program sits within HUD, Housing and Urban Development, and requires 600 million in funding so that no one who depends on its services lose housing. Um, about five years ago, the HOPWA program uh, within HUD was modernized to reflect the current epidemic. We saw a shift from total AIDS cases to, uh, the, to where populations are currently centered living with HIV. Um, and as a result, new funds are needed to keep those localities whole. So we're requesting um, an additional 170 million for a total of 600 million for the HOPWA program. Another great program, the, the Minority AIDS Initiative, uh, we're requesting 610 million or 165.9 million in additional funding to support reaching uh, minority communities with novel approaches um, that are proven to be effective. Again, Congress should support the involvement of necessary other federal agencies in the epidemic. We can't do it in silos. Just like any of the work that we do, everyone has to be talking. So we need to see the Housing and Urban Development Department, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration known as SAMHSA, and the Department of Interior included um, in, in responding to the epidemic. A few other key priorities, or one other key priority I should say is opioid infectious disease funds. We are requesting 120 million in additional funds for the opioid infectious disease funds to combat the opioid crisis that's taking place. Um, all of these things um, are, 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 are key to ending the epidemic. Um, so we've been talking about your story, um, shaping your narrative and, um, and sexual health and wellness and education. All of these things are critical and, and none of the work that needs to have, take place in the epidemic can be done without funding. So as we approach, as we approach the possibility of an epidemic, please um, shape your stories uh, to tell your policymakers how the money that they send uh, in across communities will actually impact your lives and help to end the epidemic. And I'll turn it over to, I believe it's to Victoria. Hello, everyone. Can people see me? That's great. Awesome. I can see myself even. First off, I want to apologize for the giant box of Kira coffee behind me. Uh, it's COVID. What can we do about it? So <clears throat> sexual wellness and reproductive rights. The goal of this one uh, is to focus on the issues that impact, again, sexual wellness uh, throughout the lifespan and reproductive rights from a justice perspective. Reproductive uh, justice impacts everybody in the uh, community of people living with HIV. Among the initiatives that we're advocating for are codifying the protections of Roe v. Wade into law. What does that mean? <clears throat> Roe v. Wade is a federal decision that finds a constitutional right to have an abortion However, it has been weakened over the years, over the decades by the Supreme Court, by uh, anti-abortion rights advocates and so on, anti-choice advocates throughout the years with the goal of making it harder and harder to access an abortion in, the, in, in their given states. And with the current composition of the Supreme Court, thanks to the last administration, because after all elections have consequences, we have a court whose makeup it's more hostile to keeping Roe v. Wade than ever. So it is essential in order to keep abortion a national right, for, have a national right to choose for Congress to codify into federal law the right, to, the constitutional right to a free and safe abortion, basically. Uh, the second one is to repeal the Hyde Amendment. This bans federal funding for abortion care. What does that mean? It means, for example, all the federal healthcare programs that exist, like Title X, for example, uh, so on, cannot go into abortion. They can go into other stuff. They cannot go into abortion. This also translates into, for example, uh, federal health insurance. If you're a federal employee, I used to be a federal employee uh, years ago. That's where I started. My insurance could not cover uh, abortion for either myself or an independence and so on, because that was subsidized by the federal government as an employer. Same with TRICARE for federal employees, uh, Medicare 
Medicaid and the states that cover it is because state governments have chosen to do that with their own state money. Eliminating the Hyde Amendment would enormously expand access to care, to reproduce, to necessary reproductive care throughout the span. So supporting adolescent health and sexual programs. What are we talking about? Investing in the teen pregnancy prevention program to prevent teen pregnancies. We're talking past the Real Education for Healthy Youth Act, which we already have a bill for. The past Youth Access to Sexual Health Services Act to increase the services and sexual education that exists for youth. Likewise, defund and eliminate federal abstinence only until marriage programs. What does this mean? <clears throat> right now, we see uh, federal funding for programs for the last several decades that go solely into abstinence-based sex education. We need to end that to ensure that abstinence-only sex ed is replaced with comprehensive sex education and programs that promote actual sexual wellness. Uh, and this leads to gag laws, gag rules that exist right now. Also, protect older adults living with and are vulnerable to HIV. This includes amending the Older Americans Act to designate people living with HIV as a community of greatest social need and opening up access to crucial services, meals, job training, senior centers, health promotions, benefits enrollment, caregiver support, et cetera. But this, uh, and this is particularly essential to be very honest, as our community gets younger at times, it is often easy to overlook our elders, especially uh, despite the fact that our movement has grown older, despite the fact that many of the survivors of HIV are aging into uh, being elders living with HIV. Uh, and thankfully, and that is a wonderful thing, but we cannot abandon them in, in old age. Uh, we cannot abandon our senior citizens in uh, who are living with HIV. And thus, as an integral part of the community, we have this new problem in practice, we've had it for a long time, uh, of the community. So yeah, with that, I will be finished being brief and move towards any of the questions and so on towards uh, Marianne. Yes, long-term survivors, anyway. Thanks so much, Victoria. Um, I'm going to pause here to see if any of the panelists have additional thoughts to raise about the briefs or about how to reference the briefs in Wednesday's visits. Okay, well, seeing none, um, thank you to Kamaria, Carl, and Victoria for highlighting your respective briefs. I think all of the briefs, I, I'm really proud of um, the way that the briefs have turned out. And I know that in past visits that I've been involved with, it's always been great to kind of highlight it, highlight the availability of the briefs in closing, um, just so that it um, the person who you're meeting with knows that if they did have any questions that do come up later, there is a whole host of information that's available to them um, in their AIDS Watch folder. Next up, I would like to turn over to my colleague, Phil Waters from the Treatment Access Expansion Project, who will talk briefly about the political reality that we're facing here in 2021. Phil? Thanks, Marianne. Hi everyone, thank you for being with us uh, today and for hanging with us for the whole program. Uh, I'm Phil Waters, I use he, him pronouns, and I'm a staff attorney at the Treatment Access Expansion Progress and, uh, Project, an initiative of the Center for Health Law and Policy Innovation. My work focuses on securing access to comprehensive care and treatment for people living with HIV, reducing health inequities, and promoting more equitable and effective health and public health care systems. This will be my fifth AIDS watch, and I'm truly honored to share this moment with you all because I'm very excited to be moving past this incredibly difficult political environment we have found ourselves in over the past four years. Finally, after working in a defensive mode and fighting back against Trump's policies that attacked our communities, 
Today, we can talk about advocating for comprehensive and meaningful long policy reforms that can help to address the unmet care, treatment, and essential service needs of people living with HIV. And we're in this position today because together, we never gave up and kept fighting despite the target and despite the dark times, our collective advocacy made today possible. So as Marianne said, my charge today is to give you a sense of the political reality we find ourselves in uh, and outline the path forward for working with the new administration and Congress, as well as what we need to do to educate them on our advocacy goals. In short, today we find ourselves with a sense of relief that the darkest times, political times are behind us, but with challenges still ahead and a tremendous amount of damage to undo from the past. The good news is that we're off to a great start. As to the administration, many advocates in the HIV community put a lot into getting the Biden-Harris uh, team elected, and as part of that work, not only developed a list of policy asks, but also documented the concrete plans for how the Biden administration can start to undo the harm done to our communities by Trump and his people in the first days of the new presidency. And I'm happy to say that we've already started to see the first steps of making these changes that are needed. So I want to highlight three examples of what the Biden-Harris administration has done just in about the first week of office. So first, on day one, President Biden issued an executive order on preventing and combating discrimination on the basis of gender identity or sexual orientation, directing each federal agency to review all of its rules, regulations, and policies to rescind or revise any that are not in line with the administration's policy to treat everyone with dignity and respect. This is a great start, but now we need to keep the pressure up and ensure that the Biden administration not only rewrites all of the Trump era rules, but also takes the necessary next steps to eliminate all discriminatory laws and policies that perpetuate racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, and xenophobia. Second, again in the first week, the administration issued an executive order on strengthening Medicaid in the Affordable Care Act, announcing a new direction to build on and protect the Affordable Care Act in Medicaid. This order authorized a special enrollment period to help millions of uninsured people enroll in the Affordable Care Act's marketplace insurance plans, recognizing the need to get people coverage quickly in the midst of this pandemic. This also paved the way for the Department of Justice to change its stance in Texas v. California, the Supreme Court, court case that once again threatens to take away the entire Affordable Care Act. Now under the new administration, the Department of Justice is once again defending the ACA in court. And then third, in its first week, the Biden administration issued a memorandum on protect, protecting women's health at home and abroad, which immediately rescinded the global gag rule that prohibited the funding of agencies that provide abortion counseling and referrals. This memo also directed all administra administrative agencies to swiftly revise or rescind the domestic gag rule and other policies that undermine the Title X family planning program. And just last week, we saw that the administration formally announced its intention to reverse all of these Trump era rules. So all of this is to illustrate that we now have an administration that is certainly more supportive of our needs and concerns. But as we all know from our past experiences, we cannot take any opportunities for granted. For those of you meeting with the administration officials, we have to remind them that well-meaning is not the same thing as well-performing. As advocates, we have to work hard to encourage the administration to prioritize issues that are most important to us and to understand that simply undoing the bad from the last four years is insufficient. In civil and human rights, the administration plays an incredibly important role as enforcer of non-discrimination laws, so we must keep the pressure on the administration to investigate and root out discrimination against our communities where we see it. In healthcare, the administration needs to hold insurers accountable to the Affordable Care Act's promise of comprehensive coverage, and that includes things like making sure and cover, insurers are covering PrEP and all the necessary visits and labs at no cost under the ACA's free preventive services mandate. And with the new Department of Justice, we need the administration to drive criminal law modernization, to eliminate HIV criminalization laws, and to address molecular HIV surveillance with law enforcement as a priority. I'm hopeful that together we can work with and encourage the administration to implement the laws and policies we need to promote our health, our well being, and our rights. Now I want to turn to the picture in Congress and say that, in short, with a trifecta in place, the time to demand positive changes to our systems and structures is before us.
And I hope that those of you going to meet with members of Congress or their staff on Wednesday are as excited as I am about this opportunity. I think our timing is very is perfect, although depending on your state, the meetings won't be so easy. Uh, I'm going to be kind of direct here and say that at the start of this administration and Congress, there was certainly talk and overtures towards bipartisanship, finding a path where Democrats and Republicans could work together to solve some of our nation's most pressing problems. In my opinion, those days are over, as evidenced by the fact that not one Republican signed on to the recently enacted American Rescue Plan Act. This act included desperately needed support for our nation's ailing healthcare systems, gave funding to state Medicaid programs to offset the cost of the pandemic, made the Affordable Care Act subsidies more generous for low and middle income individuals, and put long overdue stimulus funds directly in people's pockets. It also created uh, incentives for states that have not yet expanded Medicaid to do so, providing over 100% of the cost of expansion from the federal government. There has never been a better time to mobilize in our communities and get Medicaid expanded, expansion enacted in every state. So as you go into your meetings, we're gonna have to thank all the Democrats for voting for this critically important uh, legislation and politely yet forcefully remind all the Republicans that they must support law and policy reforms that address the needs of the people in their states. Now I'll say that the Democrats were able to pass the American Rescue Plan Act through budget reconciliation, which requires only a majority vote in the Senate. And thankfully, with our victories in Georgia and Vice President Harris's tie-breaking vote, we have a 51-50 majority. The reconciliation process is an exception to the general Senate rule that you need a 60-vote supermajority to overcome a filibuster, which is an objection raised by any member of the Senate and that under the current rules can result in endless debate and no vote on a law. While there is chalk of changing the filibuster rules, which I support, this has not happened yet. So with bipartisan collaboration all but dead, the Democrats are left with using the budget reconciliation mechanism to get things done. But there are many limits on what can be accomplished through reconciliation. I don't wanna to get too far in the weeds, but I do think it's helpful to briefly explain the process here. Each session, Congress gets to set a budget resolution that starts the process off. They didn't complete one last year, so Biden and this Congress have two budget reconciliation bills to consider this year. One that was just passed as the American Rescue Plan Act and one more left before the end of the year. However, there are limits as to what can be included in a budget reconciliation bill. As the name suggests, budget reconciliation must primarily address the budget. And so this process is really only used to raise or lower taxes or provide funding for certain programs. So unfortunately, the bad news here is that given these limits, without eliminating or changing a filibuster, there are many of our big legislative asks that may be really difficult to accomplish just using the reconciliation process. The Equality Act, for example, probably can't be passed entirely using budget reconciliation, nor could something like an entire reimagining of our healthcare system, like Medicare for All, likely pass through the budget reconciliation. But that does not mean that we can't advocate for passing things like the Equality Act through other means or finding what parts of it we can fit through the reconciliation process. As advocates know, it's all about how you package your asks. Major changes have come in the past using budget reconciliation. For example, much of the Affordable Care Act was passed using the budget reconciliation process. So I don't want you all to feel discouraged by this picture. There's still hope that we can use this process to get important things done. And as Malcolm and Kerry helpfully said earlier, this is a marathon, not a sprint. So stay positive in your meetings. So in closing, I wanna leave you with three takeaways of how I see this political reality before us. First, I think that when talking to members of Congress, we have to ask them to think creatively about our long list of legislative asks and be aggressive in including whatever is possible in that next budget reconciliation bill. Strongly encourage them to consider what it's gonna to take to meet the goal of ending the HIV epidemic and to include any possible provision in the reconciliation bill that will further this goal. Second, I think that we have to ask Congress, particularly the Democrats, to think boldly about how to get things done outside of the budget reconciliation process, including by mod mod modifying or eliminating the filibuster so that we no longer need a super, super majority to overcome minority resistance. To me, the past four years and the beginning of this one has shown us that the time for compromise is over. So let's take every opportunity we have and pass, this, pass every law that we can. I think we need to stop being so nice uh, I think we need to recognize that human and civil rights are not negotiable, and we need to take the risk and enact our agenda now. We have a window of opportunity, and we ought to seize it. 
Think of all the good that we could accomplish by creating laws, policies, and programs that address the root causes of racism and other forms of discrimination. Think of how many people would have better health and well-being if we eliminated barriers to care and had programs that address the social determinants of health. Think about how many people's lives would be improved if we finally got rid of, rid of the limits on sexual and reproductive health care, including the ban on federal funding for abortion, the Hyde Amendment, as Victoria just told us. Think of what we could achieve if we had comprehensive strategies to address mental health and substance use issues, including harm reduction strategies, such as removing a ban on federal funding for sterile syringes. And ultimately, think about how much we could, how much more effective we could be in ending the HIV epidemic under this new political reality. And third and finally, whether you're talking to a Democrat or a Republican, I think we need to remind them all that we have all the tools necessary to truly end the HIV epidemic. And with their support of our asks, this could be accomplished under their watch. So in conclusion, let's all be sure to keep the pressure up on both the administration and Congress. Change takes a long time, but it does happen. This is an exciting time for all of us. I hope you find yourselves as passionate as I am. I hope you find yourself confident and optimistic in your meetings with Congress and the administration on Wednesday. Uh, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Phil. Thanks for that. Um, I also want to say a special thank you to everyone who's presented today. Um, thank you to our planning partners, the US People Living with HIV Caucus, from my colleagues at AIDS United, and our uh, planning partners at the Treatment Access Expansion Project. We really couldn't do this without each of you. Thank you to all of our listeners who joined us today. Um, I also want to give a special shout out and thank you to our sponsors, particularly our longtime sponsor, the Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation, for their stalwart support. And now just a little bit of housekeeping. We're about to take a short break, but please rejoin us at 6.15. You can access uh, the link at the AIDS Watch, <laughs> I'm pointing to it, at the AIDSUnited.org slash AIDS Watch uh, to rejoin the reception that's gonna be taking place beginning again at 6.15. So please enjoy a short break and rejoin us. You can also find the link in the chat to rejoin the uh, reception later on. Take care. <laughs> 